President Obama keeps Ohio blue. From the Patel studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Reginald Fields, Columbus Bureau Chief for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Karen Kassler, State House Bureau Chief, Ohio Public Radio and TV. Terry Casey, Republican Strategist, and Sam Gresham, Common Cause Ohio. Well, we were right. The polls were right, the pundits were right, and the campaigns were right. Ohio was a nail biter, and Ohio helped give the presidency to the winner. The winner, of course, of Ohio was President Obama, who captured Ohio's 18 electoral votes as well as the electoral votes of just about every other one of the so-called battleground states to win re-election. Obama won the Ohio, won Ohio and the presidency despite a high unemployment rate and despite great unrest among Americans and despite a fierce campaign against him. The president beat Mitt Romney in Ohio by about 101,000 votes or two percentage points, a much smaller margin than 2008. And like in 2008, the, promise, the president promised to heal the nation. Tonight. You voted for action, not politics as usual. You elected us to focus on your jobs, not ours. And in the coming weeks and months, I am looking forward to reaching out and working with leaders of both parties to meet the challenges we can only solve together. Reducing our deficit, reforming our tax code, fixing our immigration system, freeing ourselves from foreign oil. We've got more work to do. For Mitt Romney and his supporters, it was a crushing defeat. He came extremely close to fulfilling his and his father's dream of winning the presidency, but he came up just short. He, too, tried to bring the country together. The nation, as you know, is at a critical point. At a time like this, we can't risk partisan bickering and political posturing. Our leaders have to reach across the aisle to do the people's work. Reggie, polls were right, two-point margin for the president. What was the difference, do you believe? Uh, well, I think it, it, a couple of things. One, I, it was interesting to me watching this race. I thought that Mitt Romney pretty much ran a single message uh, campaign across the country, not just here in Ohio, and he just kind of campaigned on the economy and jobs, whereas uh, Barack Obama sort of tailored his message to different, uh, you know, swing states. In, 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 in Ohio, for example, he talked a lot about the auto bailout to kind of mm -hmm. win those voters, whereas then when he went to Florida, he would talk about the Ryan plan because it had the Medicaid and issues like that with senior citizens. Mm -hmm. So I think what we found is that, you know, uh, that maybe that was, was part of it. And then the other part, I, I think it's just uh, merely that the Republican Party still hasn't, you know, decided that it really wants to diversify itself, and, and that's what you found. Barack Obama actually received fewer votes from from white voters, but uh, the number of people who were voting of them of, of color or of different groups such as uh, gay and lesbian kind of went up. And you got to give credit to Axelrod and company on message. Not only did they pick the right message, but they stayed on it over and over and over again. The Romney people at times, I mean, a lot of the campaign in the fall was about China trade, which really didn't yeah. work and drive the difference. I mean, how many slogans did Mitt Romney have? Believe in America. We did build this. Stronger middle class. It was like a, a laundry list of slogans where President Obama's was one forward and they stuck with it as goofy as it was he stuck with it throughout the throughout they the stayed they stayed with it. i think the m most resounding thing for me was when i heard that there were three million white people missing from the polls from the previous presidential candidate and i think i said on this program will religion trump politics and i think religion trump politics with with a lot of a lot of those people i also think the ground game not only here but nationally and i also say something else he had a smart team those people were smart and they did a lot of things that people didn't know. They were crunching people behind uh, the, uh, the board. And I also think people joke about this. The Republican Party, demographics ate them up. I've said this on this show, too, that demographics is going in a different way than the Republican Party. And I think that manifests itself on Tuesday night. Let's take a look at what the state looked like. Here's what the state of Ohio looked like. As, you, as you'll see, as the president <coughs> dominated in the cities, as Democrats usually do in the uh, north and in the industrial northeast, Columbus, Athens, the rest of that map, the red is Mitt Romney's winning counties. The pink and the light blue are the counties that with a margin of victory was only 10 points. But Karen Kassler, it was northern Ohio, the auto bailout. 
which really was sure. key for the president. And also the big cities. He mm -hmm. won the six largest counties in Ohio, and he won two-thirds of the vote in those cities. That's enough. I mean, the map, when you just look at the map, it looks like, why didn't Romney win? Well, there are enough voters in those cities, and, and that was the target. That was the plan all along. The uh, I've heard it said several times that the Obama people had a team in place since he won in 2008. It's a permanent mm -hmm. campaign in a way, and they certainly worked it. They targeted their voters very, very carefully, and, and you saw the results. But here, everyone talks about about turnout, but take a look at this. We compared 2004, the Bush Kerry race, to 2012. And look at this drop off. Comparing John Kerry at 04 to President Obama in 2012, Obama is down 69,000 votes. Now, that's not counting provisionals, so he could actually come up a bit. But take a look at Mitt Romney versus George W. Bush. Mitt Romney, 288,000 fewer votes than George Bush did in 2004. Terry Casey, that's the difference. Well, part of it was the Bush people in 04, led by Karl Rove, ran a much better ground game. And of course, Kerry didn't have anywhere near as good a ground game as what the Obama people. So ground game's important. And part of it, when you look at southwestern Ohio, which was key to Romney being able to win in the three key rain counties of Claremont, Warren, and Butler County, Romney won two, and two to one, which is good, but Kasich won there two and a half to one. Uh, Romney needed to really roll up the margins there, and you look at a lot of that southeastern Ohio coal country, gun country, Romney won, but he didn't win by the margins he needed. And Obama won some of those counties four years ago. Right. Lake County is a good example. <coughs> but if you look at Fairfield, <coughs> Richland, Summit, Stark, what McCain did, versus what Romney did, it was much better. McCain did better in Cuyahoga County than, um, than Romney did in Cuyahoga County. So I, I think it, it, it's a people gravitated. Now, the one thing I do want to put to rest, it wasn't the economy, it was leadership and trust. It was never the economy. If it was the economy, this man would have been 10 points down. It was leadership and trust. Well, I also think he he ran more of a populist, you know, sort of campaign as well, where he really tried to appeal to everyone in terms of uh, if if you are down, you know, for uh, without a job or something is going wrong. I mean, he kind of tried to reach out to everyone. Whereas uh, uh, Mitt Romney had a few gaffes along the way, the forty-seven percent thing, you know, kind of hit him, yeah. and also he was completely painted as a very rich person who was out of touch, and so I think that also hurt Mitt Romney. One other point. Back in 2000, I believe that uh, George Bush got about 40 percent of the Latino vote um, back then, and Mitt Romney probably only got, I, I, what I read was maybe about 20 percent. So again, it goes, the demographics were working against them, even though Ohio is probably not, uh, doesn't have as many uh, Latinos. Latinos. How about Rob Portman? Any re would, would he have made the difference had Mitt Romney selected him as his vice president? Rob Portman would have helped him get a few more votes in southwestern mm -hmm. Ohio, but I can't tell you that necessarily would have won Ohio. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, Rob Portman would not have made a difference in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Florida, Florida Wisconsin, where Romney also needed to do well. Karen, mm -hmm. does it come right down to it? The Republicans were not head over heels in love with Mitt Romney, your well, Republicans in Ohio? Well, when you look at, like, turnout numbers, turnout was down over 2008. And so that suggests that maybe people weren't as enthusiastic to go out to vote. We had, uh, you know, all, the, there were more registered voters in 2008, but still the turnout numbers, uh, the percentages are down. So I, I think, you know, when you look back on the March primary, you had a lot of folks that went for Rick Santorum. Those were the areas that Romney had to win. And so maybe there wasn't as much excitement there, and, and you know, yeah. you have to look down through the, the final results. Yeah, but what was also fi uh, fascinating about this race is, uh, unlike in 2008, both sides really thought that they were going to win. And I think yeah. the Republicans were genuinely just shocked that yeah. Mitt Romney did not yeah, win. No, no. And that's not always the case in these races, yeah. you know, in these races. And there was a real narrative going into this that said that the polls were wrong and that Romney was going to win. I think it set up a lot of Republicans for a very, very bad election night in the day after because not only did their candidate lose, but they were really expecting the polls to be wrong. Early voting numbers were coming in better in McCain Carey counties and lower in Obama Carey counties. And I think a lot of people were very yeah. disappointed. All right, let's get to the next race on the ticket. Sherrod Brown won a second term as U.S. Senator despite being hammered by tens of millions of dollars worth of negative ads. And Sherrod Brown 
spent a few million dollars running negative ads himself. <laughs> Sherrod Brown, top Republican state treasurer Josh Mandel by five percentage points. Karen Kassler, the big money kept it close, the big outside money kept it close. But it didn't secure a win for Josh Mando. No, and when you look down through the ballot, obviously voters, the most votes go into the presidential race, and then the Senate race is right behind it. Brown had uh, like 50,000 fewer votes than Obama. Mandel had like 280,000 fewer votes than Romney. So that suggests there might have been some ticket splitting going on here. And and I just don't know that there were a lot of folks that were really excited about Mandel. And, and, you know, if, if people were not excited about Romney, they were probably less excited about Mandel. And, you know, a negative race really does hurt a lot of candidates. And to I give think. credit to Sherrod Brown, he's an incredibly hard campaigner. On election night on another channel, I'll clean it up here. Uh, but basically, <laughs> like a Howard Metzenbaum, Sherrod Brown is relentless and he is kind of liberal and different than what some people like. But you kind of like somebody who's your SOB in order to fight and be tough for the state. And Sherrod is relentless as a candidate and as a campaigner. The quandary here in the analysis of this, this race is Citizen United. Does that mean <clears throat> unlimited money means nothing anymore? Because this is a good example where a poor candidate wasn't going to make up for the amount of money that they pumped in. Carl Rove has egg on his face. Now that is, in nine of ten races, where right. he put money in. Yeah, here's the funny thing. Josh Mandel was one of the better Republican Senate candidates. <laughs> well, statistically, he actually was the best of them, getting within five points, and give, especially That's given the name Yeah, not, I mean, Tommy Thompson was a stronger candidate for Josh than Mandel, but Tommy you know, Thompson had name ID from yeah. being governor, governor all those yeah. years, and he had worked in the cabinet. But the question that we back out of this, money doesn't make a difference anymore. But it. Issue two, it made a, it made a difference. Uh, and <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that, Sam. <laughs> and on Josh Mandel, people might say, "Well, does he have a future?" I want to remind people in 1988, George Voinovich made a major mistake in an attack on Metzenbaum, but he came back and won the top job governor in 1990. So part of it is as a candidate, and candidates on both sides make mistakes, do you learn from them, what do you learn, and then what happens from there? I mean, he, he's young enough, he absolutely has a, a future in politics if that's where he wants to he wants to, to stay. Uh, I, I hope he's learned from this race, because I thought he, he ran a terrible race. I mean, he pretty much shut out the media early on, and he never did really come around and warm up to the media, never really told in, uh, voters why they should vote for him, other than and, you know, just running a negative uh, campaign against Sherrod Brown and Sherrod Brown likewise did the same thing. But also, I just think that Josh Mandel, he went into this as a pretty clean cut uh, Marine and he came out of it with people completely not trusting him. You know, I mean, to the point where even during two debates, at least two of the debates, flat out called Sherrod Brown a liar. I mean, we're just not used to hearing that, you know, when you're in the media, just one candidate to call another on national or uh, statewide television is flat I'll call him a liar. Did he go too big too soon? Well, well in, all, in all honesty, he didn't want this race that soon, but they knew Sherrod was vulnerable because of his liberal record in Ohio, and they had to have a candidate. They Mary, he was vulnerable. Well, and Mary Taylor and John Houston were not available, and you had to have a candidate. Is it possible that, that he was the candidate because there was a thought that Obama was going to win, and so whoever was going to run against Sherrod Brown was going to lose? Is that a possibility? Uh, I think they thought they had a chance because, remember, coming off of the 2010 election, uh, there was a feeling of the great vulnerability the president had, which he did. Uh, but the reality is you it isn't yes or no on the incumbent. Yep. It's candidate versus candidate B. And as, a, as the Republican Party come out of the echo chamber where they've been in there by themselves, and are we going to get them to see a little gravity trying to get other people we'll, under that tent? We'll get to that in a minute, but I have to talk about redistricting. Oh, so. God. <laughs> <laughs> State lawmakers in Ohio still get to pick their own voters an attempt to take the legislative redistricting process away from lawmakers and give it to a commission it failed. It wasn't even close. Issue two, backed by Democrats and labor unions, was soundly rejected by the no side, which was backed by Republicans and business groups. Sam Gresham, this is the second time redistricting has been on the ballot. Is it really just too 
complicated an issue for voters to decide. Well, for those that don't know, I was the author of, of, of this uh, issue, one of the authors of this issue. No, it's not too complicated. We just didn't do a good job. We need to do a better job next time when we come out and do it. We got started late. They outspent us two to one. But what, money is not the issue anymore. We got to find a way to make this uh, more palatable so people can understand. Now, if the if Democrats are smart, they'd go into Texas, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and, and North Carolina and do redistricting efforts because if they can break those states up, it can work. Now. Final point before I, I accept the onslaught from Terry with regards <laughs> to, to this question. We are not going away. We are coming back. And Terry, your side has <laughs> promised reform. How soon will it be? Well, part of it is Sam and I were talking on election night, and part of it is you got to make a plan that is not too complicated. And unfortunately, Sam got mixed up with some university professors who made something complicated more and more and more complicated and when we had the state bar I association my well, <laughs> well when the state bar association came out early blasting this and the judges association that was very helpful but clearly whatever you do i mean the challenge in ohio this is a complicated diverse state and you just can't throw out a mathematical formula or four different criteria people want to know how's this going to work and will it be simple and understandable but it can be better than what they've got though right yeah. well, yes it can okay. be improved on and sam and i have talked about there's ways to get it done i mean issue two this it was it was going to have problems from the beginning because it was dip, it was too difficult for people to summarize if you just said just tell me real quickly what it is mm -hmm. it was it was way too difficult to be able to do that and then when you went into your as as I noticed when I went to vote on on Tuesday <laughs> it was yeah. spread across three different pages of my ballot you know to and it was you know most people aren't going to take the time to read all of that information so I, I do agree with with both though I, I think that both the Democrats and the Republicans are going to try to to address this issue because it's been agreed by both sides that it needs to be addressed but, but let me ask the broadcaster at the table. I have tried over and over again for 20 years to explain redistricting easy and, I, and gerrymandering easy. You cannot do it, right, Karen? No. It is hard to do. Not in a concise statement, and that's part of the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was something that the opponents of this seized on and said it was complicated. It was too complicated. It's too complicated to explain, especially in a year where you've got so much clutter going on from the presidential race and the Senate race. And the other complication is there's redistricting, but then there's reapportionment because whether it's a congressional district or state legislative, there's two different processes, two different separate and sets of rules. And this will bring those two together, so right. at least that made yeah, it easier. Right. But yeah, you're right. It's so hard, <laughs> and it's hard to explain to people why, why this is important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is very difficult to do that, but I think for the fairness of the democracy in our country, and particularly the state of Ohio, where you have 51% Democrats and more than 75% of the congressional seats are Republicans. It, that's a travesty, and we can't have that. That needs to be fair. And I, for those who may holler and scream, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm an independent. And I believe we should have a process that, and finally, we're not going away, Terry. Well, that's fine. <laughs> right. We're happy to work with you. One, one other interesting note from this election was the Supreme Court race. Two Supreme Court justices, incumbent justices, lost, perhaps because of their names. Sharon Kennedy, defeated Yvette McGee Brown, and William O'Neill defeated Robert Cup. Now, Karen, I get William O'Neill, good Irish name, beating Cup. It was Yvette McGee Brown. Brown. That's a pretty good and name. With Sherrod Brown yeah. at the top. And this wasn't even a little margin. This was a pretty decisive victory for Sharon Kennedy and loss for McGee Brown. And, and I, I even was on the air earlier this week with Paul Beck, who's a uh, political science professor at Ohio State, saying, I'm baffled by how people make their choice on Supreme Court. And he even said, he's baffled. It's very confusing because there's no partisan labels. And, and people, by the time you get the way all the way through the ballot, you're just... And the Who other, knows what you're doing? And the <laughs> other problem is when we have 35 days of voting, it makes it so much harder for the candidates, like a Bob Cup, an outstanding jurist, outstanding ratings, to get known all over the state when you got a 35-day campaign window. Yeah, and, and also to, to kind of back up Karen's point, I mean, people don't pay attention to any of the judicial races, and you can you notice because uh, Bill O'Neill, who won, raised no money. He spent no money. He didn't even advertise, and yet he still won uh, this particular race. Are, are you race. saying if she took McGee out of it, she would win? Well, but I think the other problem is when you're a Brown, and 
and there's already another yeah. brown, then they become a little well, you, suspicious you of what's going Kennedy's on. You saw a better name than brown. You saw, <laughs> you saw the lawn signs because a lot of the yards had Yvette McGee brown signs and Sherrod brown signs on the same lawn. She had to go with Yvette as her brand on the lawn signs rather well, than brown. Well, part of the problem is emphasizing your first name yep. is a little confusing because right. even if they mm -hmm. saw a name you that and yeah. they're looking and they're seeing brown, they're wondering. Right. It's so did Democrats take this race for granted, Sam? Well, well, well let's, let's, let's stay with the history of Democrats. They've never won with an African-American statewide. They've never won. Um, Terry convinced me that Judge Duncan won on the election as a Republican, but I didn't remember that. The Democrats, Robert Duncan, who just passed away. Yeah, right. who just passed. The Democrats have a problem, and they need to solve that problem because they have not elected a black person statewide in the history of this state. I don't know if it costs money, assistance, support, whatever it is. They need to solve that problem. And the Republicans have done it four times, yes. and I think there's a legitimate concern. Does the Democrat Party and labor really back all their candidates? Well, let's get to the diversity issues. Like after every election, the winners and losers promise to compromise. But over the past dozen years, that has not happened. And voters, even though they say over and over again they are sick of partisan gridlock, Terry Casey, after 2004, 2008, 2010, we just grew more and more divided. Is that going to continue this time around? Well, at the national level, I think there's still a problem. Because today, when the president holds what amounts to a campaign rally at the White House with people on risers behind him, doesn't take any questions, I mean, at some point, and John Meacham, a very respected historian with a book on Jefferson, made the point Jefferson didn't like it, but he spent time with members of Congress. He said this president, instead of playing golf and basketball with his staff, actually ought to meet and talk with well, members he is of gonna, Congress. He's invited the, the House, on, and he's, uh, he's invited John Boehner and the, the legisl Republican leadership to the White House next week. So. And but, but, we but, criticized him for his olive branches that he gave to the Republicans. He was ready to give the Republicans the, the House early in his, his tenure, and, and look what it got him. He and I don't say he did not reach across the aisle, because he did reach across the well, aisle. Well, but Terry his Casey. speech today sounded like, I'll let them agree with me, and that's my form of compromise. Yeah, but when you're walking around with your black eyes from the previous efforts, why you want to do it again? Well, I do think that, that you'll see more of a compromise this time around because now you have a president who is in his second term and there's no motivation to try to, you know, get unseating, rid of him. You're right. not going to be able to unseat him. He's not mm -hmm. running again. And so I do think that you'll at least on, on from the outset, I mean, we, we saw just uh, the day after the election, uh, Boehner came on television. He immediately said, OK. We're, we're ready to work with them. Carol, so. will the Tea Partiers allow that to happen? That's going to be the question. I mean, a lot of the folks that we're dealing with, a lot of the major players here are the same. The same folks, I mean, there's been a debate on how we spent $6 billion in this election and basically have the status quo, though some people would argue about that. But yeah, you've got a lot of the same key players coming back, and whether the Tea Party Caucus is going to try to shut down everything that's presented to them, that's going to be an issue. Getting back to redistricting for a moment, Terry, have Republicans by making these districts so Republican, are they, in, are they kind of hurting themselves? Is it backfiring in that it's harder to get a moderate Republican, it's harder to get someone to compromise, thus nationally, you look like the party of no. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, the reality is on these districts, people forget that like the Ohio House districts were drawn by Republicans in 2001, but the Democrats got control of the House with Armand Budish as Speaker. So mm -hmm. things can happen, uh, but part of it in politics, when we had lots of money in America and we weren't running up the huge deficits, it's easier to make both sides happy. They can each win. But when, this, we're, when we're bankrupt and we're out of money, it's a lot harder. This country cannot sustain gridlock. And the foundation of gridlock is the district lines, how they are drawn. Well, so know. something has to happen. If we continue to do this, you have exotic districts that re-elect Republicans. We're going to have gridlock. We have to have a competitive modicum in this country. Well, I would argue bankruptcy is a more dangerous situation than given the combination we have now. We're not going to solve that problem. Well, people got to come to the table, and, and I mean, you look at a Bill Clinton, he was able to compromise a Ronald Reagan. The president needs to take on the lessons. But he has legislators lessons. willing to compromise with him, too. Well, John Kasich being one of them. Right. right. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can be done, but the president's got to be the leader Help and not party, just make Terry. it. Help your party. <laughs> and with that, we'll get to our off-the-record comments. Uh, final thoughts, predictions for the weeks, years ahead. Sam Gresham, we'll let you go first. John Gruden to Cleveland. 
John, football coach John Gruden. Gruden to Cleveland. Is it going to help? ESPN analyst to the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> You're not talking to the Indians because they already know. No, okay. to the Browns. Yeah. That's, right. that's my prediction. Terry. Well, election night, Chris Redfern was very macho saying Kasich's next and I'm going to get him. But he has this one little problem. He's got to have a candidate for governor. And my sense is Strickland's liable to be packing his bags to take an Obama position. Uh, some of the other people, like Cordray, are not going to run. First of all, they got to get a candidate because this governor's numbers are improving. Okay. It's funny Terry should mention this. These were pre printed and passed out almost immediately after uh, Obama uh, was called for, Ohio was called for Obama. And uh, you, you've got an issue here with the Democratic Party. Of they, ha they understand it, it's going to take 25 to $50 million to raise money for uh, the governor's race. And uh, they expect the candidate to be very shortly. Ted Strickland, I think it's his to probably decline, but it seems like he probably will. And then you've got Richard Cordray, you've got Congressman Tim Ryan, you've got a couple, Ed Fitzgerald knows. from Coggle County. They just stole my, I was going to say, I think Ed Fitz Fitzgerald is going to announce before the end of this year because he needs to be able to start getting the name recognition and plus he's got to start raising money. Cuyahoga County Executive Ed Fitzgerald. Yes. I, and I have to say I was amazed to see the signs that quickly because you have to look at this campaign and think yeah. are people exhausted? The next campaign is now. Speaking of exhausted, my final comment is I know the Supreme Court protects political speech but something has to be done to keep blatantly false negative ads off the airways, whether it's the candidates themselves, lawmakers, us broadcasters. If Coke can't lie about Pepsi, candidate A shouldn't be able to lie about candidate B. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We are on Facebook, we're on Twitter, also streaming video of each episode at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew, for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.